Welcome to a, well, I don't want to say emergency recording, but at least a time sensitive recording. I was going to do a show, I've been making notes for it for a couple of weeks on the world without sin. As an update, you guys know it's my container metaphor for our inglorious arrival into two worlds, the artificial world defined by the pronouncements of official reality. So the, uh, the White House press secretary version of, let's say, Biden's competence <laughs> versus what's actually going on, right? So we're being pushed into, in a very Gnostic sense, this world without sin, this synthetic version that bears absolutely no relationship to and fewer and fewer touch points with actual reality. And so I was going to do that anyway, and there is a opening video clip, which we will see, that is from Glenn Greenwald in an interview with Russell Brand. So that's my way in. That's kind of why it's time sensitive, and depending on when you are watching this or listening to it, we also in the membership area have a live discussion on tyranny and power coming up. So some of you might have the opportunity to see that beforehand. If not, it will be an appropriate palate cleanser afterward. And I will also point out, depending on when you're listening to or watching this, I have a discussion with Reed Wilderness about his new book, Here Be Monsters, this coming weekend. Or again, if you're watching this with a little bit of a delay, grab that one too. So it's, uh, it's tyranny week, <laughs> I suppose, at, uh, at Rune Soup. So that's what I want to talk about, or more specifically, this whole World Without Sin update was going to be about the censorship laws that have been put into place in the Five Eyes countries, uh, particularly Canada and Australia, and also the EU, and their implications for next year. So it's the, the, the legal infrastructure for some pretty astounding World Without Sin moves that are going to be made. Uh, and if you are listening to this, it might sound a little bit echoey, although I'm going to send it to my lovely editor in the Philippines to see what he can do. I'm still in Paraguay and I've got my road set up <laughs> in the sense of I'm reading my notes off my Boomer Rectangle, aka the uh, iPad, and I'm going to be trying to navigate through some of the screen shares and videos on my laptop in front of me. Uh, if you are listening to this, it's no big deal. Like the, I have spent quite a bit of time. And funnily enough, this is a real world without sin moment. I've spent quite a bit of time making sure that this will be as good in audio from a content delivery perspective as on video, right? Uh, and holy shit, the, the, the highlighting apps that work on some things are not, so they don't work in Substack, which is where I'm sure a lot of you get uh, some of your high quality content these days. I'm the same. <laughs> and some of the videos won't play in StreamYard, which is I'm using to record this. It's a mess. And I'm going to come back to the positivity of that towards the end of the show. But that's the, please bear with me. Uh, I'm on my Paraguayan road setup, which includes, and this will not be the last time we hear from or see Terere on uh, the show. I have been consuming great quantities of this stuff. Um, for the people listening, because they did promise that, it is mate. So it's mate tea in Paraguay, because it's this country made up by toddlers where they do everything opposite. Instead of drinking it hot, they drink it cold, which, I mean, you think makes sense. It's a very hot country. In fact, uh, two nights ago when I was hosting a, a, a live call teaching for my uh, Lenormand deck for the Fortunes Falls, Asuncion, which is the city I'm in, was the hottest city in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> so on the one hand, it makes sense that the default drink is not necessarily an iced tea, although you can put ice in it, but a cold tea. It's just that that sounds logical, except that many of the main dishes here are soups, which they will eat at lunch. And there's famously a soup called Sopa Paraguay, which is actually a physical kind of like a baked cornbread. And I don't mean that one. I mean, most of the Guarani, which is a native people's inspired cuisine here are forms of soups. So they will sit down in 45 degree heat Celsius, obviously keep up America and, uh, and eat a soup. <laughs> so sweat like a nun watching porn into their lunch while sipping on a cold tea. Anyway, it's delicious. And it's the plant ally that I have been using while working on the book and, and so on while I'm here. So I've got my terere 
and my road set up and we're going to jump in. And I do, I've been looking for the blessings in the Russell Brand thing from a content delivery perspective because there are a number of IQ tests, I would say, in this episode, which is how you approach different things. And one of them is Russell Brand, right? Uh, and so uh, that's where the upside of this is for me. It's an initial IQ test when it comes to positioning around content. And I will say, I don't know if this has been your experience, but the, res the online response to the accusation, this is a weird way of saying it, has been broadly good. What do I mean by that? I mean that, let's call it both sides. And I actually don't think there's too many both sides on it. That's one of the broadly good things. The, um, the unrepentant Me Too types are expecting some kind of horde of unthinking super fan support for Russell Brand, regardless of whether or not the accusations are true. And I don't see, because I'm certainly, I, I'm, I have become more positive towards Russell Brand over the last three years, obviously. I think he's a less, this is so mean. I think he's a lesser version of what Jimmy Dore does and I am ride or die Jimmy Dore. I think he is the perfect combination of comedy and uh, political analysis that I'm in alignment with. Russell Brand kind of does the same thing, a bit more of a carnival barker, right? And I don't, everyone's, when these moments happen, everyone says that, because fuck, it happened to me. Everyone's like, um, I'm not defending him because I'm, I'm thinking super fan. I said, yeah, we get it. No one's, a, it's the year of our Lord 2023, okay? We get it. So I do come at it from the point of view that I'm more in alignment and actually just generally impressed with his output over the last few years. And it's not so much his political positions, but the fact that he will have Whitney Webb, who I absolutely adore, on the show and also Tucker Carlson, Right. And th that's going to become relevant as we move into the Glenn Greenwald clip, who is someone else I'm right or die with, who has also been on the show. So we have the, the unreconstructed Me Too types from the year of our Lord 2017 expecting this horde of super fans to defend him regardless of any of the underlying truth in the accusations. And we also have the people who were more in his camp kind of waiting for these Me Too types to be like, oh, you know, um, and this is all very true, like, like innocent until proven guilty and so on. So we have like an inflamed reaction on both sides of it that is almost like waiting for the others to show up. And they kind of haven't been there. Obviously, people are going to be more on one side of things than the other. But when I say broadly good, I think so far anyway, this is only a couple of days in at the time of recording. The nuance has been there, right? Like so both sides seem to be waiting for the other to make a really bad take. And whilst you can find them, it's the fucking internet. Uh, there are far fewer of them than I think anybody on either side of them feared. And I think that's good. Okay. I think we've like learned some lessons. Thank you, Jeebus, from the last few years. What, the best take, again, this is a few days in, and this is still fucking true, right? This is always true with this stuff. There's a best take I, take I saw on Twitter, AKA X. I'm paraphrasing. I wish I'd saved the tweet because I didn't know I was going to include it in this episode, right? I believe women, but I don't believe mainstream journalists. And so far, we've only heard from them, which I think is fair. <laughs> Not too many people would be surprised that the mid noughties Lothario will have, may well have some skeletons, right? Not too many people would be surprised by that. Uh, the old, like, you know, the incident of proven guilty is true. Uh, and it's not even anonymous at the moment, accusations presented to the police. It's coaxed anonymous accusations brought out in hostile mainstream media. Now, one of the points I wanted to make in this episode, and I have a whole extra post about this, is in 2023, everything is going on. There's not like a correct version of what's going on. Everything is going on. Uh, so he is innocent until proven guilty is going on, as is the like, well, color me unsurprised if, <laughs> if it's going to be some stuff there, right? But that's the, the, the IQ test coming into 
discussions of censorship and the world without sin is that everything is going on. Narratives are being weaponized to build the world without sin that will contain truth in them. The best example of this over the course of the, uh, the Ukraine situation has been Russia Today, which is obviously a the fucking pro-Russia. Yeah, of course it is. It's fucking Russian state media. What the hell's wrong with you? But its method of providing, let's say, pro-Russia positions or propaganda is to tell the truth about <laughs> stuff that NATO is fucking doing, right? So that's an example of everything is going on. It's like this is pro-Russian propaganda. It is, uh, and it's accurately describing stuff that NATO is doing. So there's a, there's a nuance that the Russell Brand situation several days in has given me a little bit of hope that a sufficient number of people can understand and move through this Pachakuti apocalypse moment that we're in. The best take, inevitably for me, because a, God bless Australian Hellcats, uh, is Ra Rose McGowan. And I woke up this morning to her, voice, not personal, but to her um, voice tweet, which I'm about to share. Just before I do, I swear, if I had the, a crew or a team to be able to do daily content, there's a two hour video, there's a fucking master's thesis in the meta text of Charmed mapping our apocalypse and the end of the West over 20 years, right? So let me just give you a brief version of that. Remember that Alyssa McGowan, well, I obviously don't follow her on Twitter or whatever, but remember at the beginning of the health narrative, uh, the dramatically overblown health narrative before even masks, which of course do nothing, were forced upon people. Remember she had that, she shared a picture of like a knitted, herself wearing a knitted mask that you could plainly see through because it was like a fashion statement. It wasn't, it was a fashion statement of political allegiance and people just went to tell her like, this is a perfect example of the idiocy of the official message. And you compare that to Rose McGowan, right? Uh, just in general, politically. And so there's that component of the, the, the kind of like original girls from Charmed being a microcosm of what's going on in the world. But then we have the disastrous and mercy, mercy killed early reboot where they made them all Latina, except they kept the magic, this sort of version of the British Isles magic that could only have come from people who've never been to Britain or Ireland. And I remember when I came out, I wrote a blog post about it because I was still regularly writing on, on culture that what a missed fucking opportunity, right? Like, uh, it was, oh, it's work. It's like, you know, it's Latin chicks now because you can't have uh, white girls doing anything, which is not correct. But the, the missed opportunity is like, well, if we're going to make the, the charm girls Latina, we should make their magical heritage Latina. And especially as it's set in California, there was a powerful commentary that could have been done there about migration, Latin influence in California, stories of the collapse of San Francisco. It could have been the best show we've seen in 10 fucking years. And it was uh, the kind of abortion that even Republicans would get behind, right? Like this needs to die. <laughs> this needs to die in the womb with a coat hanger. And most of it did. <clears throat> but it's super fucking funny that you could do a... <clears throat> a meta-analysis of Charmed as almost predictive, like a, a spell of prediction about the end of the West. If anyone wants to do that, uh, do let me know. Anyway, that's by the by. Uh, I want to share with you Rose McGowan's commentary several days in because I think given her experience of sexual assault and her support of victims in the face of power, this is a voice that I think is, is really useful to listen to. So do bear with me as I, nope, that's wrong. <laughs> that's already on my road set up. If you were watching this, uh, I messed that one up because I saved it as a video. So have a listen to this. Let me start this by saying I stand with all victims. I think what's being done right now in the Russell Brand case with the Guardian and the other news outlets is part of a concerted effort to turn the public in general against anybody who comes out. And one of the reasons and ways they're doing this is a concerted effort to bend 
journalistic rules that have always been in place, such as having to be on the record with who you are and what your name is in order to accuse. I didn't make these rules. These are the rules. They were the rules. So there's something very strange going on when these rules are being bent in order to push a narrative. It's almost like Icarus flew too close to the sun. He's a low-lying fish and not one of the truly powerful, so he can be thrown to the wolves. I don't know if he's guilty. I don't know if he's innocent. That's not what this is about. This is about driving us further apart and mainstream media and media outlets protecting people on a higher-up level from true consequence, from what they're really doing and what they're really getting away with. And the real losers in this are actual victims. I'm sorry and hurt for anybody who's been hurt. But this narrative and the way it's being done is just pushing this culture war, pushing us farther apart, and pushing any gains gotten by people believing accusers to the edge. And, and this is a way to have us not be believed. This is not the way the reporting is done. You have to go on the record. It has always been that way. I didn't make it so. It didn't make me happy to have to do so. Neither did it make others happy to have to do so. But to blindly and anonymously accuse none of these high-level journalistic outlets would have ever let this be published before. So I have to ask why. Why now? What is the true narrative they're pushing? Thank you, Rose. When I said that there was an IQ test, the first IQ test, like an intelligence gate in this episode, and really in the whole kind of meta concept I'm going with here with the world without sin, it's true. As she was talking, I have another metaphor, which I think I like better, which is that it's an immune test. Russell Brand is an immune test to see if you can drink from a poisoned well. And I don't mean because he's poisonous or toxic or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, because the water is not going to be pure. It's 2023. There is no pure water. And that's actually literally true, unless you come to my farm. Uh, because between now and the end of the decade, you learn to drink from poisoned wells or you die of thirst. That's the story of media as we roll out the, the collapse of the West. Okay? That's the story of it. Now, funny enough, that's kind of a preamble, but a really exciting position can you drink from wells where the water is not 100% clean is the right way of moving into, I guess, the original shape of this episode, which is to begin with Glenn Greenwald. He was being interviewed last month on Russell's show about the, this is pre-beginnings uh, of the Biden impeachment investigation, but looking at the difference in treatment uh, between the many thousands of indictments for uh, Donald Trump versus the nothing that's come with the naked, uh, brazen corruption on one particular side of it. And he makes the point prior to the excerpt that I'm about to share that when Obama came into power, he said, uh, and this is bearing in mind like that the Bush Cheney administration did literal war crimes. It's like, only banana republics prosecute political enemies. We need to move forward, blah, blah, blah. So, and the political establishment was completely behind it. And we're now in a moment, which I will talk about later, where uh, that's no longer the case, right? But that's not the, the real medicine in what he said. Uh, and this is the, both the IQ test and, and the immune test. Uh, it's a commentary he made towards the end of the interview. But I, I need to frame it in the context of in... Glenn Greenwald's expert legal opinion, bearing in mind that he had just gone through personally the same thing with uh, Brazil, where Lula was in prison, uh, and it's, it's the same kind of quote-unquote banana republic situation. So, and he was personally involved in, in that story and in getting him out. So this isn't just like a woolly take. Here is a, a, a lawyer and celebrated journalist who has personally been involved at, in the legal framework that prevents and stands against essentially fascism, right? But that's not the point. I will jump to the Glenn Greenwald video now, which again, if you're listening to it, you'll just hear. And Russell, I think this is the key question that is central to everything that was embedded in the question that you asked, which is I know like me, 
you're often accused of having changed your political views or having moved from the left to the right, et cetera, et cetera, even though you haven't changed any of your political views at all. Somebody who's listened to you for quite a while, I know that to be true. The reason that's happened is because what is the relevant metric now is not so much left versus right, but it's anti-authoritarian versus pro-authoritarian or anti-establishment versus pro-establishment. Namely, do you think the loss of trust that these institutions of authority have suffered is valid or not? Do you think that they deserve the contempt in which they are held by a large portion of the population? I believe it's absolutely justified to hold in contempt these political agencies, the U.S. security state, the corporate media, big tech, for all kinds of reasons. And I think standard classic liberals, you know, by which I mean just Democrats, ordinary Democrats, even the part of the left that claimed they were launching a revolution under Bernie Sanders and AOC and the like, have come to view these agencies as their allies and therefore legitimate. That, more than anything, is the relevant fundamental distinction that I think defined, de defines our political structure, much more so than full definitions of left versus right. So that's something I've been looking for for, I've been saying it for almost a decade, but that's something I've been looking for for a while is a really tight framing of, because um, it's that, oh God, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but the, the shit lib war supporting take is that if you say like left or right, if I'd say left or right doesn't describe the most urgent uh, political landscape anymore, people say that some kind of red brown alliance far right claptrap because anything that is stands opposed to this uh, intelligence agency technocratic uh i guess fascist ploy and plan for global governance is accused of these idiotic things which makes the capacity to engage in uh change making impossible which is why we can be very uh confident in our predictions that this just ingloriously the, the west ends the way britney spears gets out of a car at this point there's nothing <laughs> to stop it yet, you know um leave britney alone i think it's really important to position when we come to deciding which well to drink from our yardstick as establishment anti-establishment rather than left right because the poison is everywhere. Uh, and I was looking for that statement to move in to where this all goes next, because I'm not sure how many more of these I'm going to do. The reason I'm not doing this as a live stream, because I generally do prefer them because I get, you know, fun questions and chat at the end is I don't know if where this conversation or this broadcast goes, if I can even put it on YouTube and thus I might end up putting it on. I mean, it was always on rumble. All my episodes end up on rumble and odyssey anyway. And we'll get to this, but please motherfucking subscribe on whichever one of them you use because we shall need them uh, before this is all over. The point is, I'm not sure <laughs> if we're going to end up saying things that will damage the channel. And that's part of the reality of what I mean by like looking at anti-establishment versus establishment. Uh, and they will be towards the end of this episode recommendations other than that uh, and techniques for how to handle it because this doesn't get better that's my point it gets worse and you should look for the wells that are more anti-establishment rather than establishment because the poison is less because the poison is technocratic the poison is arconic the poison is uh structural right it it is order it is governance itself that is the thing that's ending so that's that's quite key uh and i was looking for the right framing, and it was a few weeks ago, Glenn Greenwald on Russell Brand, and then the Russell Brand stuff happened, and my first thought was actually, oh, should I even do this episode now? And then managed to reframe it as like, no, you should do it exactly now, <laughs> regardless of your crazy ass, boomer rectangle, Paraguayan tea setup, like now is the time to do it. So this is the time to do it. I'm going to jump in and do the... Uh, screen sharing now. Again, I'm, I've highlighted everything. So if you are watching this, uh, listening to this rather, it's not a big deal. I'm going to catch you through all of it. I remember back in um, after Trump's election, something Matt Taibbi, who is always someone to listen to, 
uh, says said, which is like, we need to be careful with this is because he was a big part of the uh, bringing down of the always ludicrous uh, Russiagate hoax. And he said, we need to be careful that with Trump, because this is what ended up happening, that the cure isn't worse for the disease, worse than the disease. Because in an effort, uh, and it's, uh, it's Truman or someone earlier who said, uh, it's burning down the barn to catch a rat. And unfortunately, that's what's happened. So the, the cure has ended up worse than the disease and continues, right? Be and every time you try to, rather than just deal with essentially another Reagan, uh, the establishment lost its mind and burned the barn down to get a rat. And we're still doing that. And the trouble is every time you do something like, and this is what the first article is about, every time you put someone like this in prison, they get more popular rather than less, which means you have to do more of that activity, which makes them more popular. This is the cure being worse than the disease. If this lunatic man could have just run on his apparent merits, the West wouldn't be ending. But that's not what's happening because we've burned down the barn to get the rat. And this is a quote from uh, Martin Armstrong's book. Trump won the first GOP debate without attending as the most discussed candidate was not present. Former President Donald Trump declined the invitation to debate the other GOP candidate and instead appeared on Tucker Carlson for a private interview. And that was so much more important. Such a powerful example of like, in attempts to exclude you, what you actually do exclude is the entire political process. <laughs> Fucking wild, right? Some of the most prominent historical figures amassed notoriety and popularity after prison. This has been both negative and positive with Nelson Mandela or even Adolf Hitler as examples of, Hitler, uh, of leaders whose popularity spiked after being jailed. Now, the economics confidence model has Trump at 61% popularity in the election next year, but it also shows with the level of corruption and civil unrest that there may not even be an election. And if there is, it will be a ludicrous farce of one, right? Now, why 61% doesn't sound that uh, high, but actually most elections are sort of around all democracies or republics are like 51, 49. Most of the time, it's like just slightly more than half wins. So 61% is a literal motherfucking landslide. And to get a number like that, like he might be campaigning in prison, okay? So not that I, this is the whole point about, here's maybe the first intelligence test, it is. The second intelligence test is being able to understand that Matt Taibbi's position, that the cure is worse than the disease when it comes to something like Trump. Uh, and the effects of that are showing up, I would say, well, certainly in the blended cycle model, but I think showing up in the longer term trends, uh, astrologically speaking, but absolutely in the blended cycle model, right? I think there is, it's almost like, that's the next message, right? So there's only anti-establishment now. Uh, I think that's the correct magical position, which is where we've always belonged. And that was my surprise over the last three years to find out that uh, that correct position was not shared by some idiotic flapping heads that will nevertheless charge you lots of money for their courses. Uh, become a member, 12 bucks a month. That's how much these things should be. <laughs> All right. So that's the first bit. Like, a line along establishment, anti-establishment. I think the next message to, or medicine to sit with in this episode is Matt Taibbi saying, make sure that the cure isn't worse than the disease. And that's the right framing when we look at, holy shit, what's going to happen with the difference between, uh, it allows you to frame what's going to happen inevitably, I would say, with like Biden impeachments and probably swapping them out and, whatever, that treatment of uh, naked, brazen corruption and treason versus the, uh, and I'm not, again, I'm hoping you can hear that this isn't a pro-Trump statement because it's not, uh, versus how those many indictments are going to play out on that side. And when you can jump up to the, here we are with the cure being worse than the disease, that's the right framing to, rather than falling into like, uh, the, the whataboutism of the, the kid glove treatment that the establishment's going to get versus Trump, who I can't bring myself to call anti-establishment because he's a New York billionaire. Uh, um, that's the right framing in the same way like establishment versus anti-establishment is. It's like when we look at the, the establishment supporting itself 
uh, trying to keep itself in power, which is what the cure being worse than the disease is about, that's the right framing to go through this without going fucking insane. Staying with Matt Taibbi, because what we're talking about here, and this is something Catherine Austin Fitz talks about often, is the collapse of rule of law. Like, rule of law is over in the West, and particularly in the United States, but over the last three years, plainly, around the world, there is no rule of law, there is no separate judiciary to not just, let's say, um, the rest of governmental power, but there's no separation between governmental power and uh, corporate priorities, and that the judiciary has shown itself to be handmaiden to that. Uh, and so when you have a collapse of rule of law, it, the rest of the structure that the world runs on, which includes how money works, all the rest of it fades, right? And so that's where we are. And this is so important when it comes to world without sin, moving uh, anti-establishment voices away. This is a couple of weeks ago, and it's when the gray zone got its funding shut down by GoFundMe. And it's uh, when I look at this is from... Matt Taibbi's uh, Substack. The online crowdfunding site GoFundMe just shut down a fundraising initiative for the Grey Zone, a left-leaning anti-war site led by Max Blumenthal and Aaron Monte. Jumping down, I spoke to Max yesterday and he's appropriately furious as his site's Go Fuck Yourself logo shows. Even those who don't share Grey Zone's politics should be outraged and alarmed. The anti-disinformation complex we spent so much time on after the Twitter files is close to perfecting the application of financial pressure Finishing a job begun 13 years ago when PayPal froze donations to WikiLeaks after the leak site received a letter from the U.S. State Department. This system is nimble enough now to financially disable actors as different from one another as an American porn star and the London-based Free Speech Union. So this has happened to Nigel Farage. This has happened to the people who supported the Canadian truckers. And it's happening, all of which are anti-establishment. And again, that's my yardstick. Do I actually share um, Nigel Farage's complete um, distaste with the EU, uh, the rest of his politics to do with immigration and so on, I will politely say I'm not in alignment with, doesn't matter. Like in the sense that I, we're not gonna be best friends. He's anti-establishment and he's getting the treatment that the establishment meets out to anyone who's anti-establishment, beginning with him and ending with a very important anti-war voice, which is the gray zone. So you can pick up that story, which Matt Tybee probably should have, from Alex Jones as well. And I, everything I just said about <laughs> Nigel Farage, I can say about Alex Jones. When you get that funding removed, and by the way, um, PayPal can um, hold any of your funds in, ex in escrow when it decides that there might be something wrong for apparently up to nine months. And people ask, like, can I, pay, can I you know, do my membership via PayPal? You cannot. And not that Stripe's any better, it's just a little bit further along technically, or like behind technically <laughs> in being able to do that. But uh, this piece of the punishment mechanism that the establishment uses is a very important component to the world without sin because you eject voices that are not in alignment with the world without sin, which is the, the economy is strong as hell bullshit that we've been uh, the, uh, being told as the official reality. Anything that falls outside of that is being disintegrated every way possible. And that includes cutting off. It's not just, oh, it's not showing up in Google results. It's being deplatformed on YouTube, all of which I'm about to talk about. It's actually like, no, you, you don't get money either. And this is a, a system of ejection that can work on an individual basis. And by the end of next year, an individual basis anywhere on the planet as we go through it. That was the point of this episode before the Russell Brand stuff happened. And that was more just like a, an entry into it. Uh, so the collapse of the rule of law means that, like this shouldn't happen. It should be nobody's goddamn business if you want to, with your money, which is what blind actual currency used to do before, support Canadian truckers or Nigel Farage or the Grazer, whatever it happens to be. Uh, that used to be how things would function. And now they duck. And it's not, and we can, I guess I would say, because it's not so much black pilled as it is a, um, a slow release white pill, because things do get better, but they get a whole lot worse for us, is um, this only gets worse from here until full collapse, right? So we need to stay on top of it from an outrage perspective. But the idea, unfortunately, that the outrage evinced by Matt Taibbi and others 
Michael Schellenberger and so on about the unfunding of anti-war platforms like the Grey Zone is going to do nothing. <laughs> That's only going to get worse, but we have to share it so that we can bring that into our own strategies and positioning. The, um, the next part, and this was the main thing going into it, it all these like world without sin things happened when the main topic area I wanted to discuss is the one that's coming up next, which is the malinformation, misinformation, disinformation laws that are rolling out around the world. And obviously because the, the center of retention falls on the United States, I don't think people are aware of just how stupid and powerful the laws are being rolled out in the five eyes and most especially the EU. So we're going to start with Canada and then Australia, and then we're going to go to the EU because this is just, a lot of you, you guys don't see or know this, but so essentially what happened in Canada is a typical Justin Trudeau stuff, right? But Meta rejects Trudeau's olive branch in Canada online news feud. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government released new details of a law that tries to force technology companies to pay news providers. But Meta Platform said it will continue to block users in Canada from seeing news stories on Facebook. Facebook has already blocked users in Canada from posting or seeing links to news stories, cutting off an important source of web traffic for a number of news companies. A spokesperson for Meta said the draft rules will make no difference, as the legislation is based on the incorrect assertion that Meta benefits unfairly from the news content shared on our platforms. Today's proposed regulations will not impact our decision to end news availability in Canada. So essentially, Trudeau tried to get Meta and Google and X. I can stop changing it. Uh, oh, let me do it right. Meta and Alphabet and X. <laughs> stop changing your fucking name to pay news companies because the, the thinking was, oh, well, that's what people come to Facebook for. People, which is to say boomers and early Gen X, come to Facebook to share uh, racist cat memes. And in fact, I think, I can't remember if I, if I saved this tab, exclusive, Meta's Canada news ban fails to dent Facebook uh, usage. Well, it wouldn't <laughs> because people... If you were still in 2023, and I'll come back to this actually, if you were still like nine hours a day on Facebook, you are what in the media industry is politely called a low information voter or a low information user. So the idea that you will notice and stop using Facebook because the CBC, which makes uh, the BBC look like the gray zone, um, the fact that you've missed the official state pronouncements about uh, getting your next injection or whatever is a farce. And it's just astounding. And I, I'm quite impressed because Meta led the charge on this uh, to just block Canadians from being able to share or see mainstream news on their platform. And they've seen no difference in their business as a result. It's calling this lunatic fool's uh, bluff who, by the way, again, at the time of recording, is threatening grocery companies with an inflation tax because of the inflation his energy policies and everything else to do with destroying the economy have caused. It, you can't, this is why the West ends, because he can't conceive, I mean, he wouldn't, he's corrupt, uh, but he can't conceive that his policies, he can't conceive that he's wrong. That's the world without sins problem. Because it can't conceive that it's wrong, it can't get updates from the universe as to where to change things. And that's why this ends. That's why this all comes down, right? But this is so fucking funny, I think. Um, it gets less funny when we move to Australia, uh, where, you know, that's the wrong tab. So a couple of weeks ago, someone was interviewing our prime minister and the question was one of the softballs that these people always get, like if you were king of the world, what would you do first? And he said, ban social media. Now, I don't love social media. Uh, what I like less than social media is banning anything. And this is that, again, a narco-libertarian anti-establishment thing that used to be part of magic. And I would argue still is part of authentic magic, uh, regardless of what you can and can't see on social media platforms in Canada. That's beside the point. That's really just to give you an indication of the police state psychopaths that is, I said this all through the, through the last three years, 
Australia has a narrative, a self-narrative that is wrong compared to what it actually is. Uh, everyone jokes like, oh, it's a nation of convicts. And consequently, it's like a nation of outlaws or criminals. Nope, it's a nation of prison guards. And I mean that literally because if you look at, say, Foucauldian analysis of the development of the panopticon and the prison system, the British Empire perfected it and perfected it in Australia. And if you want to see things like panopticons and cruelty and the use of psychological warfare to get convicts to police each other, I invite you to study colonial Australian history because that's that we are um, prison guards of each other, pretending that we're, we call them bush rangers, right? But like cool, <laughs> cool anti-establishment times. Now, Australia's misinfo bill paves way for Soviet-style censorship. Under the draft le legislation, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, will gain considerable expanded regulatory powers to combat misinformation and disinformation, which ACMA says poses a threat to the safety and well-being of Australians, as well as to our democracy, society, and economy. Digital platforms will be required to share information with ACMA on demand and to implement stronger systems and processes for handling misinformation and disinformation. ACMA will be empowered to devise and enforce digital codes with a graduated set of tools, including infringement notices, remedial directions, injunctions, and civil penalties, with fines of up to $550,000 dollars, dollar dues, and $2.75 million dollar dues for corporations. Criminal penalties, uh, including imprisonment, may apply in extreme cases. Controversially, the government will be accept, exempt from the proposed laws, as will professional news outlets, meaning that ACMA will not compel platforms to police misinformation and disinformation disseminated by official government or news sources. Faced with a threat of penalty, digital platforms will play it safe. This means that for the purposes of content moderation, platforms will treat the official position as the true position and contradictory information as misinformation. Some platforms already do this. For example, YouTube recently removed a video of Member of Parliament John Ruddock's maiden speech to the New South Wales Parliament on the grounds that it contained medical misinformation, which YouTube defines as any information that contradicts local health authorities or the World Health Organization medical information about COVID-19. YouTube has since expanded this policy to encompass a wider range of specific health conditions and substances. The no complete list is given as to what these specific conditions and substances are. Under ACMA's proposed laws, digital platforms will be compelled to take a similar line. So that's running in front of whatever mRNA injection will come along with your CBDC is actually working for whatever um, illness they say we need it for next. And look how well that went. Which again, everyone's like, well, I'm not going to put up with that. It's like, you fucking will uh, until you won't. And then the West ends. Expecting rationality to show up here, is, it doesn't happen, right? That's a big deal. So we will recall that Horseface are done uh, last year or the year before, said the government will be your one source of truth. Uh, in New Zealand for whatever's going on. Uh, and they had the uh, highest rise in all-cause mortality since World War II uh, as a result of that. But of course, I won't be able to say such things on YouTube for much longer in Australia. Hey, I'm in Paraguay. Bring it on. This is a really big deal when it comes to uh, Australia. This commentary from a, a newspaper called The Australian. Misinformation is defined very broadly. It is information that is false, misleading, or deceptive and is reasonably likely to cause or contribute to serious harm. The bill then uses an extremely wide definition of harm, which includes things such as harm to the environment, harm to the economy or a section of the economy, or disruption of public order or society in Australia. I truly can hear, because I know Australian colonial history, not at an expert level, but certainly better than a normie level, I hear, like, I hear a British accent saying that, disruption of public order or society in Australia. That could not be more colonial. And it also just covers, like, whatever we want it to be. There is no requirement that the maker of the statement knew it was misinformation or that they intended to cause harm, which is the, if you, if you know about free speech law, there is the, um, well, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater kind of angle. 
which is, so we, we need a law around not being able to do that. Another way of saying that is like uh, intentionally malicious uh, speech needs some kind of framework of protection around it. Now, that sounds good in, in, uh, when you're at university learning law. It's the thin end of the wedge, <laughs> which ends with defining harm as anything that includes disruption of public order or society in Australia, so that they can just decide that, any, and that you don't need to be malicious. So there's no requirement that the maker of the statement knew it was misinformation or that they intended to cause harm. It's uh, quite a dangerous moment. <clears throat> statements made by academics are exempt, but not statements made by non-academics on exactly the same topic. So an outsider with an unfashionable view could find that contribution has been deleted as misinformation. Given the seismic contributions of unfashionable outsiders throughout history, this shows an extraordinary lack of wisdom. Now, obviously, this law has been to... Uh, they've learned their lessons from the last three years of um, having, frankly, better experts fall outside the official position. Um, Peter McCullough, Jay Bhattacharya, you know, the Great Barrington Dec Declaration versus Anthony motherfucking Fauci, right? So they've learned their lesson, but it's, it, I like how this uh, opinion piece has phrased that statement because let me give you another academic outside the system, Giordano Bruno, the official saint, or unofficial because he's not actually a saint, uh, of Rune Soup. So statements made as part of professional news content are exempt. But those statements are not exempt in other contexts. So if a journalist made a comment on their personal Facebook page or appeared on an independent podcast, their statements can be misinformation. And if a statement made in professional news content is repeated outside of that environment, it would not be exempt from the law. ACMA's coercive powers under the bill are very concerning. Those powers apply not only to digital platforms, but to all Australians. ACMA may pursue any person it believes they have information about misinformation or disinformation on a digital service and that it requires the information to perform its function. ACMA can force the person to appear before it to answer questions about misinformation or disinformation. So they can hold people up to ask them questions if they believe they have information about someone else's spreading of misinformation. Uh, it's where we move from Soviet Russia to East Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this is what's coming, right? And because I'm bringing this up, this isn't like a, oh, we, you know, write your fucking senator, like, look how well that worked. This is so that you know, so that you can build your digital strategies to operate where you need to inside the world with that sin and mostly operate outside of it, right? That's what magic is. That's its promise. That is the electrifying Luciferian, in a metaphoric sense, energy of the anti-establishment. All right, so that's Canada and Australia. I mentioned the YouTube maiden speech of Australian politicians. Uh, where am I going with this? Over to Europe. So CJ Hopkins, who ha writes often on Off Guardian, and he's been on some Solari Report episodes and so on. I, d I have nothing against him. Uh, he's a little bit long-winded, but it was always very nice to have someone, any fucking any port in a storm over the last three years. Is, uh, he's American, he lives in Germany, and if you look on the video version of it here, his book, I'm gonna describe it to you, relax if you're listening, The Rise of the New Normal Right, uh, and has a picture of a mask on it, and they're hauling him up for, and they have subsequently charged him for propagating uh, Nazi symbols and iconography. Now, if you look at it, it's nothing of the sort. Um, and so this has happened, and literally being policed for thought crimes and, and uh, successfully accused of them, like charged with them. And you hear nary a peep from the establishment. That's the quotation I'm gonna go with here. There are a few bigger sources covering the story, which are also increasingly being branded illegitimate. Matt Taibbi's Racket News, Michael Schellenberger's Public, Glenn Greenwald's Locals Operations, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few more, forgive me. The point is, unless you're a charter member of the science-denying, conspiracy-theorizing, hate-speech-speaking, anti-vaxxing, misinforming, left or right extremist club, i.e. people who read malinformationist publications like The Grey Zone, Off Guardian, Off Guardian, Zero Hedge, Dissident Voice, and Unlimited Hangout, and who are planning to vote for Bobby Kennedy or, God help them, Donald Trump, you probably have no idea what I mean when I refer to the crackdown on dissent, or you do, and you just think it's hunky-dory. 
So he, th this piece he goes through is his story of uh, being charged in Germany of thought crimes. <laughs> what the fuck are we doing? That's not the EU story I want to tell. The EU story I want to tell is scarier than that. And it is the rollout of their law, um, the Digital Services Act. Uh, now, for background personal context, when I was in London, I had to deal with the um, companies in Britain's compliance with the data laws uh, that the EU was rolling out, which were plainly intended to move in this direction, right? Uh, and again, the compliance, because of the way the EU structures its laws, it's, it essentially means even though my business is in Australia, I still need to be compliant with EU data law because I have European listeners, viewers, members, whatever, right? So I'm just going to give you this quote because so they're familiar with this process of making a law in Europe structured so that it can be applied on a global basis. The DSA was presented, so that's the Digital Services Act, was presented as a tool for the EU to reign in the power of social media corporations. But in reality, its primary purpose is to give the EU legal precedence to force big tech companies to apply EU censorship standards to their platforms, even if they are not European-based businesses. In other words, the goal is to force the entire Western world to accept the European governance of online speech while ignoring national boundaries and constitutional protections. Similar to China's great firewall, the EU plans to use the DSA as a means to shut down domestic access to offending websites and content. But where the EU situation is unique is in their focus on controlling speech outside of Europe as well. That is to say, information and speech among non-Europeans could still be identified as a threat to their leftist sensibilities and cited as a reason for sanctioning a website altogether. If you listen to this, I'm reading from a zero hedge Articles. So they're leftist sensibilities. I want you to hear, not that that's wrong. Uh, I want you to hear that as um, maniacal technocratic sensibilities. <laughs> this means, for example, that an EU friendly censored version of Twitter might still not be allowed to operate, not because of information shared by Europeans, but because of information shared on Twitter outside of Europe. The EU will not be happy until every other country follows the same online rules they share. These rules would include EU hate speech and disinformation restrictions. So the law is structured in the sense that if you uh, are operating in Europe at all, the business must comply with European uh, rules that are um, described in the Digital Services Act. This is really bad, uh, but it's and, and the fact that it's uh, EU out is deliberate because actually it turns out, speaking of Alex Jones, although that was at the beginning of the episode, I remember watching something he must have said in 2003 or four about how the new world order is going to be rolled out and um, the EU model is a framework. So it was supposed to go like, we'll do like an EU and then there'll be like a North American version. There'll be like three governance zones and then it'll be rolled up into one. I'm not sure if that plan is in play anymore. But it is absolutely true that the, as far as I can tell anyway, that the, if you look at how the EU is structured, and Dr. Fowler wrote a whole book about this uh, uh, being, one way of describing it is um, the Nazi plan for a greater Reich in Europe had to make sure that people felt like they were participating in the process without actually being participating, without participating in the process. And that's exactly how the EU is structured. <laughs> And to roll out that structure from there. But what it means is that the technocrats who don't even pay tax, by the way, um, give themselves free reign without being able to be held accountable to a democratic process. So that's where you want your technocratic laws to roll out from. Uh, and why that's quite important, why being able to force compliance to um, speech into platforms is when we get to the ID and currency component. Uh, which is where we move next in this story, because they need, they're putting the pieces in play from a uh, official reality discourse perspective that will uh, allow them to, which is what's rolling out now, uh, bring in that digital ID, which is required to make a worldwide currency work. So that's the plan. Um, and I've been saying that since March 2020, when I said a, uh, a health narrative is being used to roll out a uh, technocratic governance ploy. And uh, 
here we are being 100% motherfucking right. But anyway, <clears throat> this is scary. This is, a, this is a big deal. So at the moment of recording, it is September, which is essentially elite meeting palooza, September 2023. So we've just, this is about what we're coming up to. The G20 is to set its meeting in India. There are uh, UN and WEF meetings going on, I think, as we speak in New York. But if you're a premium member and you've looked at some of the geopolitics presentations, the most recent one listed the, the, um, the Davos classes series of meetings all through September that are going to issue the pronouncements for what we do over the next 18 months. And these, uh, the next two are the, a big deal. So I verify the UN's sinister new tool for combating misinformation. The United Nations Development Program has quietly announced the rollout of an automated anti-disinformation tool, iVerify, this spring. The UNDP demonstrates how Ver iVerify works in a short video where anyone can send articles to iVerify's team of local, highly trained fact checkers to determine if an article is true or not. The tool also uses machine learning to prevent duplicate article checks and monitor social media for toxic content, which can then be sent to verification teams of fact checkers to evaluate making it a tool with both automated and human facilitated elements. On its website, the UNDP makes a blunt case for iVerify as an instrument against information pollution. Information pollution, it's amazing. Uh, I did a communications degree and it's immediately following the 90s and you know, being a chaos magic invisibles kid to hear these terms going like, what the fuck? I mean, I suppose it's my cohort and a little bit older that are forming these laws, but it's like they went through the same learning process and picked the outer church <laughs> rather than the invisible. Um, on its website, the UNDP makes a blunt case for iVerify as an instrument against information pollution, which they describe as an overabundance of harmful, useless, or otherwise misleading information that blunts citizens' capacity to make informed decisions. <sighs> Um, more troubling, iVerify has already taken on extensive fact-checking projects in Honduras, as well as in the African countries of Zambia, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Kenya, apparently using the Global South as a testing ground for the technology while simultaneously normalizing an anti-disinformation discourse favorable to the political elite internationally. Now, particularly when it comes to Africa, because they've had centuries of colonial experience and barely submitted to the... Um, the injection hysteria, which is why their all cause mortality didn't move in the same way that Australia and, uh, and New Zealand and, everyone, and Germany and everyone else's did, right? Unsurprisingly, iVerify's external fact check, this is, we're still talking about the Global South, uh, fact checking projects themselves are flush with Western cash, with Liberia's Local Voices Liberia fact checking desk co financed by the European Union through the Liberia Media Initiative Project led by Internews in Liberia where Internews is supported by groups like Google, the Omidyar Network, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Open Society Foundations. And Sierra Leone's iVerify Sierra Leone is supported by BBC Media Action, also partnering with Canada, Iceland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the EU. Zambia's iVerify program finally includes backing from suspected CIA front, you said, uh, that's openly CIA, <laughs> UK aid direct, UK aid, and a number of Western countries. So this, uh, the machine learning part is more of that kind of like Klaus, Klaus fourth industrial revolution claptrap, right? Uh, which is they're looking for a AI component to automate the removal of dis slash mal information and associate its creators and promulgators with an ID that will do things like switch off their money, right? And, Hopefully, over the course of this episode, you're building that picture. Uh, and speak, well, I've got a class video for you. No, I'm going to do it now. Uh, and this one's in French, so uh, with subtitles, which means if you're watching this, you shan't have a problem. But I'm going to, I won't do the voice because I can't do the voice. But uh, I will, um, uh, let me play the video and I will try and talk over it. <laughs> so I will read the French subtitle. Well, they're not French subtitles. I'll read the English subtitles for you who are listening. So just bear with. Dans ce nouveau monde, uh, il, on doit accepter une transparence. Je dirais même une transparence totale. Tout va être transparent. 
Everything Et il faut s'habituer, il faut se comporter. Ça devient, comment dirais-je, intégré dans votre personnalité, mais si on n'a rien à cacher, il ne faut pas avoir peur. The famous, if you don't have anything to hide, you shouldn't be afraid. Yeah, and, and then there was that extremely sinister little aside, like this becomes integrated into your personality. Right. Not to belabor the point, but this gets back to what, we, you know, to this whole question of internet censorship, that they drive home what you can and cannot say so many times that even if you're not actually censored, you, you end up doing it yourself. But the really terrifying thing about this moment for me was the use of this word transparency. He's obviously speaking French, but he uses it. Um, uh, transparency there. Transparency once meant the opposite. If you go back and look in the 60s, like when they, for instance, when they first passed the, the, the Freedom of Information Act, transparency meant the people now had visibility into the workings of government. That's right. what transparency once meant. Right? When... Klaus Schwab talks about transparency. What they mean is that the government and other groups are going to now have transparency into your thoughts, your opinions, yeah. and everything that you do. And it's here to stay and you better get used to it. Right. They have completely reversed the meaning of a word that once we once had very positive associations with. Uh, I think that's terrifying. Right. It's like as if the FOIA, like Freedom of Information Act, was for the government to look into you as opposed to the other way around. Right. What he's saying there is that you should give up the idea that you are entitled to privacy inside the confines of your own skull. And I, I don't know. I think that's horrifying. But yeah, of course. You know, it's 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 amazing. It's amazing that that this happens and people just don't. They're like, whatever. It is amazing, Matt. Uh, I started doing the reading of the subtitles and realized, wait a minute, it's from Useful Idiots. <laughs> I'm the idiot in that context. And that uh, Matt and Katie were about to talk about it. So here we've done, uh, there's no left, well, anti-establishment establishment is a better yardstick. We've done that and we've done, uh, don't let the cure be worse than the disease. The next one I want you to understand is that total surveillance is being rebranded as transparency. Because what Klaus means by uh, transparency is surveillance. So for the fourth industrial revolution to work, uh, the system needs full transparency, total surveillance of how you operate digitally. Uh, and like it literally does need that for a digital currency to work, which is one of the reasons why digital currency is uh, redundant and unnecessary and a risk because during the war, we're going to get EMP'd. We're going to lose all of that shit. It's a conversation for another time. And frankly, it's a conversation for the member area. But um, that's key. As we move into the final article is they're building an infrastructure of total surveillance and they are calling it transparency because it is a world without symptom. Surveillance is bad, right? Transparency is good. It belongs in the world without sin. And so this metaphor, um, there's a gift that keeps on giving. Let me just jump back to the correct screen and we move to the final story, which is quite, this is from a few days ago. G20 announces plan to impose digital currencies and IDs worldwide. Oh, ever could have predicted this? Me, me, motherfucker. Uh, the leaders of the group of 20 nations have agreed to a plan to eventually impose digital currencies and digital IDs on their respective populations and concern, amid concern that governments might use them to monitor their people's spending and crash dissent. Transparency. And we're going to have to get used to it. The group announced last, last week that they had agreed to build the necessary infrastructure to implement digital currencies and IDs. So that necessary infrastructure, I've been following again in the private members area, what that looks like from a coin perspective which is immaterial uh, in, a, in a public forum, and frankly, at all. All you need to know is that the um, central bank digital currency projects that are going on in 90-something percent of countries that have central banks around the world are being not administered, but convened by the Bank of International Settlements to make sure that the back ends are interoperable. So even though it might be, I'm in Paraguay, so I'm sure, in fact, I know that Paraguay has a digital currency 
central bank digital currency program, part of how they've sold that to central banks is that this is how you're going to be able to sell and trade debt internationally. So if you want um, to continue a version of bond sales, you're going to need to build one of these things. So that's how they're bringing the trap uh, around everyone. For countries who might not be aligned, they still need to participate in the international bond market. So that's how it's being sold. But in the background, that interoperability means that you can just switch it on to a digital currency that's associated with your digital ID, that's associated with an iVerify style total transparency process that will um, ensure full compliance. And we will see, this brings down the West as I've been, not only did I say this was gonna happen in March, 2020, but the process of implementing it brings down the West because too many of us are too stupid to realize that this is what's going on until, so it's too late to stop it. Uh, but its implementation will cause the collapse of the West. Unfortunately, in that process, because again, this is that world without sin, almost V for Vendetta uh, component, additional resistance creates additional uh, tyranny, which creates additional resistance, which creates additional tyranny until the tyrannical process is overturned. That's how it always works, always. <laughs> so that's why we can be entirely confident that this brings down the West and should be planning accordingly. That's a bigger, and we do that in the members area, that's like a bigger discussion on how you find what it is, what is yours to do moving through this Pachakuti, that process. In this episode, I wanna finish off with, uh, digitally, some real, some like top level, it's like tactics and metaphysics. Okay, so the tactics, tactically, you need a platform strategy. Now, that means, if you are I, like, if you if you like this content, um, please subscribe on find me on Rumble or Odyssey. Um, obviously, blah 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 newsletter, all the rest of it. Do that kind of stuff, especially the newsletter. What I think you should do for the content that you enjoy, one is support it. Uh, that seems obvious, but like I know times are tough and whatever, they will get tougher. But more importantly, make sure you have multiple points of contact with the uh, material that you deem essential to how you sense, make, and find coherence in the world. I, as a media theorist, which is kind of what I was for a while, I have to go through it as someone whose business is media. So there's, there's a level of interest on that side, but I also seem to delight in almost standing outside of this process and being intellectually interested in it. Because I was intellectually interested in it, a communications degree, like I said, 90s chaos magic becomes early noughties career, even though I'm 27 still, don't look into it. Um, I verify. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm actually intellectually interested in how this works. And so some, obviously the members have, I think, and it will get better and better um, with, as tools adapt. Um, the membership is going to have, including the member content, the best possible way I have of... Uh, making that safe from this total transparency, amongst other things. That's a moving target. Uh, and it has, because total transparency and the world of that scene, I'm very interested in the friction versus lack of friction. Uh, it, it, everything's going to be slightly more difficult because we are moving into war and the collapse of the West. So whilst it might be convenient to have a single Google sign in and have everything show up cleanly via 5G on your phone, that stuff as of now, gets passed through this world without sin process that we've described and is garbage. Uh, you are going to need to put in more effort to find, to, to join the newsletters, to use different platforms, um, Telegram and so on. This is what I mean by tactical. And there's an overall tactic statement, which I've been saying for years, but I want you to understand that how we move through this Klaus total surveillance world is like daisy chained groups that are only connected on mass at the level of the field. So being in and sharing across different telegram, I'm just gonna use this as an example because we've got a RuneSoup telegram group, right? Uh, different telegram groups and email forwarding and all the rest of it. And yes, that can actually dip in and out of social media platforms as well. But it's like the, uh, the anti-establishment medicine is one of connections on those levels. And it's even connections of 
coming back to that idea that anti-establishment versus establishment, it's even connections on the level of content outside of your, I would say, traditional political home. So I, I shared a couple of uh, my, my content, personal content consumption behaviors. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting now. So there's a couple of, what, how many have I got open? Uh, actually, only two uh, Zero Hedge articles. But there's Substack, there's Jimmy Dore, there's what have you. If you can frame your well drinking along that establishment, anti-establishment access, it invites the right kind of engagement outside of traditional political homes, mostly because they no longer describe what it is we're going through in a way that is helpful in getting you through it. Uh, and part of that process is going to be, in fact, it's on one of these. It's on the EU one. If I, I can't remember if I'm still screen sharing, I am. I'm going to big in my face and jump back to it because we're at the end. Uh, part, of, part of this process let me come back to the EU article as a good example. Um, these rules would include uh, EU hate speech and disinformation restrictions. The next line in that is keep in mind that many parts of Europe using the wrong pronouns for a trans person is considered punishable hate speech. And pointing out that medical masks are useless for stopping COVID transmission is considered dangerous disinformation. So you're going to end up with, um, and by the way, I do not think um, pronoun errors count as hate speech, just if you're like, going to get angry about that. Uh, I don't think, I, I will use people's pronouns. I, I have no fucking problem with that, but I don't believe in any kind of prescribed speech. So, but the point is, so this article going on going, yes, 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 thank you for covering this Ducronian social media censorship laws that are now officially enforceable, nodding along, nodding along, and then you'll hear that, ah, well, that's no good. Right? <laughs> and you get the same thing. I mean, Jimmy Dawes moved off it, but he was very big on the Green New Deal. Uh, and it's the same kind of like, oh, okay. So, this is drinking from wells with varying degrees of poison. And that's part of the tactics of daisy chaining people in alignment along an establishment, anti-establishment axis and uh, material that is useful for sense-making and coherence and moving forward in that world. This is the simple maturity of our kind of Russell Brand moment to circle it the whole way back. The second thing, and this is a temp, depending on when you're watching this, this is a temporary suggestion. I said this to the members a few months ago. Uh, one of my favorite vloggers up until this year uh, is Catherine Manning. And not because she changed her content, like she didn't go fucking nuts. She didn't QAnon or anything. She just got pregnant and she's just like a normal lifestyle vlogger. So when you're pregnant with your first child, the vlogs will become about that, which was less interesting to me than like her house story. Doesn't, that's not the point. The point is she set uh, one of her goals for 2023 from like her business and expression pers uh, perspective is post more, care less. And that's the right energy to bring to, I was about to say post, the post-cancellation world, which to some extent it is, if you're looking at the hit job on Russell now, whether it's true or not, it won't end up in the same uh, cancellation oubliette that it might have a couple of years ago, right? And we're sort of, this might even be the first big example of how it is we sense make through someone's good and bad parts in a post-cancellation world. But that's sort of post more careless. All these, like, this is coming back to maybe I'll end up using uh, Meta more. I have reactivated and started sharing stuff on the, on the uh, Runes of YouTube page uh, and reactivated Twitter on the post more careless um, like mission statement because it's all a fucking mess now. It's all a fucking mess of idiocy tumbling, like I said, like Britney, Britney Spears getting out of a car into the full collapse. So I'm going to share some F35 memes as, as part of that. So it's not like returning to some great free speech bastion because Elon bought Twitter because uh, that did not, that position did not age well, let's say. But it's just, well, of course it's not. Like, it's not going to be free. You got duped. The, the people who were upset when it was a, a um, shit lib echo chamber got upset when Elon bought it. The people who thought it was going to become some sort of, like, a billionaire-funded free speech platform 
also got upset. Like I'm delighting in how many people are upset by every and Meta. Honestly, the fucking coolest thing they did was turn around to Trudeau and say, "All right, well then, no news on the platforms. Um, we'll see who blinks first. Like that. That's like the coolest thing Zuckerberg's done somewhere in between ever and in the last ten years, right? But at the same time, they launched Threads, which collapsed hilariously. Find the idiot joy in these platforms and then leave them when the time comes to leave them. And in the case of Twitter slash X, he bought that because he's competing to build that digital ID. He wants an everything app. And there will come a time where that completion process is done and that'll be a time to leave Twitter slash X, right? In between now and then, and I'm not saying jump back on Twitter, I'm saying host more care less because it's through that process, folding it back up. That's like the metaphysical thing, folding it back up into the technical or ta tactical advice is it is in that process. It's like one last harrowing of hell. It's in that process that you will build the largest possible, necessarily small web of connections of people who are sufficiently aligned in anti-establishment positions for you to move forward together. Rather, and that's like a tactical way of saying finding tribe. You should still do that. Finding tribe, I would contend and have contended, that is a process that operates at the level of the field. I'm talking more tactically in the sense of finding uh, digital, finding a sufficiently aligned digital connections to contribute to a sense making. So it's like a subset of tribe finding. It's not the same thing, right? So that you will end up being in daisy chains of connections with people whose politics are only a 60% overlap. And this is part of that well drinking. So that's my, those are my thoughts for a rather lengthy, it turned out, World Without Sin update. It is, uh, and I wanted to end on some advice and, and some positioning. Maybe, maybe we'll even elevate this to medicine, right? So anti-establishment, establishment access is more important. Uh, cure being worse than the disease uh, is more important. Um, total surveillance is being rebranded as transparency. And then maybe we bring in Catherine Manning's post more care less, but do it with a tactical intention of this final harrowing. You've got. So Armstrong thinks the CBDC rolls out um, April, May next year in the US. So you've got a year, a bit over a year of the post more care less, find those webs of connections until it becomes really important to have a disruptive digital ID as much as possible, which is to say you might end up closing your Twitter account and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's my, that's my Russell Brand versus the establishment world without sin update. I hope you found it useful uh, and yes, Hello or um, goodbye from Paraguay. <laughs>